Good morning, and welcome to our webinar on state and federal funding for childcare, what you need to know, and how you can use the information to advocate. I'm Cecilia Zalkin. I'm president of Advocates for Children of New Jersey, and we're very pleased to be able to offer this webinar today. Um, looking back, it's been one year uh, since the pandemic started, and we were only beginning to understand what the impact of the pandemic would be on childcare. Uh, it certainly has been an unprecedented year on so many levels. And I thank you all, not only for joining us this morning, but for everything you've done over the last year to help sustain childcare, uh, to help serve families and continue to provide care for children. I think it has been an amazing year. And when we look back on how everyone, our public and private partners, have stepped up to address this challenge and sustain this system, um, I think there are many, many stories to tell uh, about everything you've all done to advocate and, and also to continue to serve families. Um, this month, actually, last week, when the American Rescue Plan was signed, it provided another unprecedented opportunity. For the first time, almost $50 billion was allocated for childcare. Um, we'll ask uh, Danielle when she comes on if this is uh, the biggest increase we've had in childcare. I think it is certainly unprecedented and it really is an opportunity to continue to support childcare to meet the challenges of the pandemic and beyond. But it's also an opportunity to see how we could use these resources to build a stronger childcare system for the future. But to advocate, you need to understand what the fun what funding is coming to New Jersey as, and what the funding is for, as well as other opportunities that can sustain childcare uh, as we look toward the future, how the money can be used, um, and other, other ideas for how that money can be used to be, build a stronger system, looking at what some other states are already doing. So we've arranged an expert panel this morning to discuss these issues with you. I'm gonna introduce everyone in, in order of their presentation, and then they will come on after their presentations. We'll hear first from Megan Tavermina, who's the president of the New Jersey Association for the Education of Young Children and an amazing partner with ACNJ in advocating. Um, she's going to set the context of what this last tumultuous year has meant for childcare. And then we're very excited to have Danielle Ewan here from Education Council. Many of you know Danielle. She's certainly been a friend to New Jersey. Uh, she's our national go-to person on everything federal, certainly about federal funding and federal policy. Danielle is going to discuss the American Rescue Plan and its implications for New Jersey, as well as some of the other opportunities um, to strengthen, sustain, and build a better system. Then we will hear from Natasha Johnson, who is the Assistant Commissioner of the Division of Family Development and the Department of Human Services. Natasha is going to talk about how New Jersey has used the federal funding we've already received this year to strengthen, sustain childcare, and I think implement some policies that have been critically important to maintaining our childcare system. And then we'll hear from Cynthia Rice, who is a senior policy analyst at ACNJ. She's going to discuss the advocacy opportunities of the federal funding, but also the, the plan that New Jersey must submit this year on the child care and development block grant, and also the state budget, um, because in addition to the federal opportunities, uh, the state budget was introduced last month, and we have an advocacy opportunity from now till June when the budget is enacted. So before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping things. We hope to have some time at the end for questions to the panelists. So I would ask you as you're listening to the panelists, please put any questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will monitor those questions and at the end, uh, time permitting, we will raise them with the panelists. You can continue to participate in the chat. It's always nice for people to introduce themselves. Uh, but again, questions should go in the Q&A. And I should mention also that we're on Facebook Live. So if you want to acknowledge that, that would be great. Um, again, welcome. And I'm going to turn this over to Megan Tavermina. Thanks, Seal. And thank you for um, to ACNJ for the opportunity to join you this morning. As Seal mentioned, my name is Megan Tavermina, and I am the current president of the New Jersey Association for the Education of Young Children. 
as well as a fellow center director who, like most of you, has faced reopening and operating an early education program during the COVID-19 pandemic. As so many of us know, New Jersey's early education system has been an alarmingly fragile system for decades. Last year, before the pandemic hit, many early learning environments were frightened, were frightened with ter- uh, their budgets on a weekly basis that, with constant fears of having to close. And then the pandemic hit, making these fears a reality. Although this was a terribly stressful time, And I do recognize that there were centers and family child care providers who did not make it through the unstable financial months of last spring. We did see some positive steps for our industry. Thanks to the hard work and dedication of multiple state departments, we saw some emergency steps that taken that not only saved many early learning centers, but it also modeled some of what is needed as we begin to step out of the pandemic. Looking over the past 12 months, what is it that did work? I wanna take a few minutes to look at the past year and talk about the steps taken that helped and the areas where we still see fractures. The most influential adjustment that came from the pandemic was changing the subsidy payments from attendance to enrollment. This switch gave providers predictable revenue and allowed hundreds of centers to remain in operation. In addition to that, centers saw an extra $300 per subsidy child, which helped pay for the gap between the traditional subsidy rate and what early education and care truly costs. We also saw an impressive stand-up of an emergency child care system for essential workers, where tuition was paid for, giving those families financial respite from those huge monthly, that huge monthly expense. The the emergency child care was paid at a higher rate than subsidy, allowing providers the flexibility to meet the rigorous health and safety standards of operating during a pandemic. Thanks to emergency funding, many centers were able to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program, giving them a small amount of relief from pressures of payroll and staff turnover. Most importantly, this gave centers who do not serve subsidy eligible families a small drop of revenue. Additionally, health and safety grants allowed providers to purchase needed supplies in a time when savings were depleted and revenue was sparse. The great work by our state is appreciated, and I feel confident in saying that the emergency funding served our industry well during an uncertain time. But now what? These changes were small band-aids put on a massive fracture to try to hold things together for a short period of time. Many centers who have depended on those supports are now trying to figure out how to manage the financial cliff that happened when, as some of these supports go away. We now are looking at significant issues as we move forward. What are those fractures and and how have they continued to corrode the foundation of our industry? First and foremost is a lack of adequate compensation. We just cannot continue to ignore this. After the work and stress that this workforce has put in this past year, how do we continue to build a system around the issue that the drivers of this industry are paid minimum wage or slightly more? The professionals in these classrooms are doing critical and essential work while their job description continues to become increasingly more demanding and complex, yet their compensation is often the lowest it can legally be. If we are going to categorize the early education professionals as essential, we need to compensate them as such. New Jersey needs to decide if we want to fill our early education systems with entry-level employees or high-qualified professionals. We cannot continue to build on a system that required degrees, experience, training across all aspects of development while only being paid minimum wage. There are many early education professionals that cannot lease a car, apply for a mortgage, go to the doctor, or even pay for their own childcare. And oftentimes they rely on public assistance themselves to try to make ends meet. As you would imagine, the compensation issue has created a workforce supply problem. This is a right now issue. I have heard from so many providers across the state that they cannot open classrooms because they don't have teachers. COVID-19 has depleted our already slim workforce pipeline. Starting back in the spring, we heard of so many early education teachers who made significantly more money on unemployment than at work, causing many to step back from the profession, retiring and moving or moving to another field that has less health risks and higher pay. 
And speaking of higher pay, many of us have seen the headlines of Costco and Amazon offering $16 to $18 per hour for a starting wage. To take the words from a colleague of mine, Winifred Smith Jenkins, Costco and I should not be pulling from the same pool of employees, but we are and I am losing. Right now, providers across the state are panicked, trying to find enough staff. Yes, I said staff. We're not even at the point where we're trying to find those qualified teachers right now. Then what often happens is they come in and they leave, quickly recognizing that the high demands of the job and and the low compensation that it comes with. This turnover costs centers thousands of dollars in training each time it happens. The reality of the situation is that there are many areas of New Jersey's childcare system that are in need of attention. But if we don't address the issue of workforce compensation and supply first and foremost, we will have empty classrooms that won't be able to serve any children. Building on this, we must also address the issue that most providers are not able to offer health coverage. How do we ask current and potential early educators to continue to work in classrooms where they are susceptible to so many things beyond COVID without any health coverage and a minimum wage paycheck? Beyond COVID, we will still have a situation where treating a simple case of strep is financially unachievable. We have the opportunity now to close the gap and give our profession the needed affordable health coverage they deserve. Looking at the subsidy system, we know that the subsidy system offers a great deal of funding to the childcare industry. However, we can see that there are issues surrounding the subsidy program that will continue to create instability for the industry. We have seen the stability that the new subsidy payments based on enrollment has provided. Centers cannot afford to go back. Providers simply cannot simultaneously try to rebound from this past year, try to catch up on repairs and improvements, cover the financial gap of subsidy and the true cost of care, as well as have ongoing potholes in their revenue streams each time a child is absent. Secondly, we saw so many centers that can only rely on parent pay tuitions and thus are left out of practically all funding opportunities, creating a great divide in our system and forcing centers to push the full cost onto their families. There are very few families who can truly afford the cost of high quality early education. There are many New Jersey families that don't qualify for subsidy yet can't afford care. Their providers are forced to raise tuitions out of their financial grasp, leaving families without the early education they need and centers without equal opportunities to public funding. Infant toddler spaces are also an issue that we need to look at. Pre-pandemic, many providers cannot afford to offer infant toddler care, creating deserts across the state. Running and creating high quality infant and toddler classrooms will become even more out of reach without new innovative funding ideas. The pandemic has also highlighted the need for a robust family childcare system. We need to build on this and allow family childcare eligibility for tiered reimbursement. And then we want to look at facility improvements. There simply is nothing left in providers' pockets to address f- facility upkeep and improvements. Looking ahead, our industry will continue to grapple with how to make necessary improvements and to create high quality spaces. This is a truncated list that highlights the largest issues affecting New Jersey's early learning systems as a whole. It feels overwhelming, but there is hope. We have an opportunity in front of us that none of us ever imagined. Now is the time to be innovative and address the issues that will create an early education system that is organized and funded as the public public good that it is. Thank you for inviting me this morning, and I'm now going to hand things off to Danielle to hear about the latest of federal and state funding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, That was a great uh, overview of what providers in the state are facing. And I'm now going to share my screen and do a couple of things to talk us through what the possibilities are given where we, um, what's gone on at the federal level to make funding available for states. If you'll just give me one second for my screen to load. So 
Hi, everybody. This is Danielle Yuen. I work at a place in Washington, D.C. called Education Council, and my job is to really help um, states and local communities understand how federal dollars can be used to really improve what happens for young children throughout their early lives and their early experiences in childcare, Head Start, preschool, pre-K, family childcare, and as they move into early elementary. So today I'm going to talk about state and state and federal funding that is available for the early childhood system and how we can advocate for increased um, opportunities for kids and families across the spectrum. I'm gonna do three things today. I'm gonna talk about the federal coronavirus relief that has happened over the last 12 months that can help us invest in children, families and providers at the state and local level. I'm then gonna delve into some of the allowable uses and I'll give you some examples of other places where uh, change has happened. And then I'll talk a little bit about the advocacy opportunities that you have in your state and some ways to maximize those opportunities. So over the last 12 months, Congress has acted three times to um, increase funds available at the state and local level to address the pandemic. The most recent opportunity was the American Rescue Plan that was signed a week ago today um, by President Biden. The American Rescue Plan is by far the largest of all the investments. It provides $1.9 trillion to support continued relief for states and communities and families. It has a historic level of federal investment in, in education, as Seal mentioned, including in early childhood. It has significant investments in other income supports. And I wanna emphasize this based on what Megan was saying is we know childcare providers in particular often underpaid and under-resourced, both in terms of salary and other compensations. And the American Rescue Plan has a number of pieces that can help address that. And I'll talk about those in detail. It has dollars for states and local communities to um, stabilize their budgets so that they can invest in their police forces, in their firefighters, in their state and local capacity to address the virus relief and to get other funds out the door. Those are funds that are really designed to stabilize government. It is true that most of the funds in the rescue plan are short term available for one to two years and that they can, um, however, the funds are designed to be used in ways that will stabilize each industry, each component of the education system of state and local communities so that over time they can recover and we can then have things to build back upon. So while the money is one time one year or in, in the case of the childcare funding two years, it's really important to think about them not as one time only, let's do something quick and dirty and get out, but rather as pieces that can be put in place to create a really strong foundation for moving forward post pandemic. So let me step back just for a second and remind folks where we've been over the last year. So as I said, over the last 12 months, Congress has acted three times to invest in states and local communities to address the coronavirus epidemic. Um, the first was in March of last year where we passed the CARES Act. The second was in December of 2020 where Congress passed the Consol Consolidated, Reconcilia uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act known as the CRRSA. And the final was the American Rescue Plan, which just passed last week. And you can see in the chart the significant amounts of money that have gone into various parts of the education system. Across early childhood, we've gotten over $50 billion, that's a billion with a B, to invest in childcare providers to make sure families have access and to increase the supply of what's available in communities as providers were dealing with the incredible effects of the pandemic, as Megan talked about. There has also been significant impacts on the K-12 system. As many of us know, most school districts were closed for some or, some or all of the 12 months. And the three different bills dropped quite a bit of money into the K-12 system. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the American Rescue Plan's 130 billion because there are implications for early childhood. In higher ed as well, there have been major, major investments, including 40 billion in the most recent version. This can, this can help our providers as well in terms of access to community colleges, in terms of access to scholarships, and indeed in access to childcare to make sure that they can go to school if they need to. And you can see that just think, thinking about the early childhood system across early childhood into K-12 and then through higher education, that there is a huge amount of money dropped in. Just in the American Rescue Plan, the last column, there's 210.6 
$1.5 billion. These are historic amounts. These are amounts that have never been seen in these settings before. And these are amounts of money that will have to be spent very, very quickly. And so identifying the needs and making sure that the families, the providers, the students, the children that need the money the most are first in line will be incredibly important. So let me focus a little bit on additional components of the American Rescue Plan. As I said, and as Steele emphasized, there is about $50 billion in the American Rescue Plan for childcare and Head Start. And I'm gonna talk in a little bit about some very specific ways that those funds can be used. But it's really important to remember that there is a lot of, there are a lot of other things in the bill that can support our children and our families. Um, the one that's not on the slide is the increase and extension of the unemployment insurance. So for those folks that have lost their jobs, those families, those providers, there continues to be support there. But you can see on the slide that there are many, many other pieces that are incredibly important. I'm not going to go through all of these, but when I'm done speaking, I will put a, um, several resources into the chat that will help you, that can explain these and that you can um, read through and understand on your own. But I wanted to call folks' attention to a couple of things. The first um, on the slide, the fully refundable child tax credit and the expansion of the child dependent tax credit, those two things can put money in families' pockets today. The fully refundable child tax credit is designed to start going out the door from the IRS immediately and on a quarterly basis to give families their share of $3,000 or $3,600 per child over the next 12 months. This is money in pockets. This it has, it has no strings. Families don't have to have any tax liability to qualify for it. Um, and it will be a game changer for many families to get those funds. In addition, there's an expansion of the child dependent care tax credit. So families that have child care expenses that are not covered by other federal or state um, subsidies can get help paying for child care. Um, these two things alone are incredibly important. The child tax credit by itself is estimated to reduce child poverty in half. Now, these are only in place for a year or so under the ARP, and it is our hope that Congress will extend them and make them permanent over time. There are also stimulus payments to families. That's the $1,400 payments that you've heard about. Uh, we have been told that by this weekend, $90 million in stimulus payments will already be going out. Um, and that's just a drop in the bucket for what they ultimately will send out to families. But again, a game changer for those families that are struggling with job loss or decreased hours during the pandemic. You can see several other things on the slide. There's increased funding for home visiting. There's funding for IDA, including targeted funds to increase access for children, for infants, toddlers, and preschoolers with special needs. And this has, um, again, real implications for childcare, for connecting families with early intervention services for connections with child find and other things. There are new funds for students experiencing homelessness, including preschoolers who are experiencing homelessness, uh, which can make sure that those families get access to services that they have been, may have been locked out of for the last 12 months of the crisis. Importantly, to Megan's point about our providers not having access to healthcare, there are a number of different healthcare provisions in the ARP, including subsidies, to pay the premiums for those folks who have lost their job-related health care and, and are now paying for COBRA. That COBRA extension for insurance can often be very, very expensive. And the law provides a significant subsidy to help families pay for those COBRA uh, premiums. The law also extends um, the, Amer the ACA, the Affordable Care Act subsidies, and will fully subsidize those families that need help paying for health care up to 150% of poverty for family income for the next two years. So again, thinking about the needs of our providers, thinking about the needs of our families, healthcare is obviously a huge one right now, and that is something that the IRP covers. Um, it also extends the ability to buy for nutrition through extension of pandemic, electronic benefit transfer, and extension of SNAP increases that were in previous versions. So again, the design of the bill of the American Rescue Plan is to make it possible for families to get what they need to make it through the rest of the crisis from the pandemic. It is to make sure that communities have funds to invest and make sure that core services continue to be in place. It has funds for states to address the needs across the spectrum in education to make sure they're stabilizing all the spaces where children and families are cared for. So I'm gonna talk specifically now about some of the uses for, of funds that we can use in the early childhood system. And I've split these into two different slides. I have one called short and medium term policy changes followed by, no surprise, a long-term policy change slide. 
Some of these may in your state be uh, more long-term, some may, may be more short-term, but I organize them this way because we have to chunk these things. Otherwise, all of we won't be able to do anything because we'll all be overwhelmed. But thinking about it in terms of, okay, let's get started on these. We can do these quickly. And then moving into larger scale transformative policy change is where we really want to go. So just to remind folks, there are a, about $50 billion nationally available over the last 12 months to invest in childcare and early education. That $50 billion um, translates to $40 billion from the most recent American Rescue Plan, um, which in New Jersey will be just under about a billion dollars coming into the state, we believe. It may be, that may be slightly different once the final numbers are in place. But again, it's a significant amount of money coming into the state right now. And you can see on the slide, there are quite a few ways that we hope that states will use these dollars. Megan talked about paying providers based on enrollment rather than attendance. We, those of us at the national level believe this should be a policy that doesn't just, isn't just in place right now, but should be a permanent policy. And we hope that some of the advocacy will be around changing that so that we're always paying on enrollment rather than attendance as private pay families do. And across the country, we saw 44 states adopt this over the last year. Um, one of the costs that a lot of providers have incurred that is cutting into their bottom line are the expenses of PPE and other cleaning and sanitizing materials. And a number of states have used the funds they've gotten through the various relief packages to pay for those, including Arkansas. Colorado included diapers in what they gave out to providers as part of their PPE and other materials. And importantly, some states are thinking about how to bring providers into the vaccine distribution system. In Delaware, for instance, they've held a number of large scale events designed to vaccinate childcare providers. Um, they had, the most recent one was about two weekends ago. They had a giant parking lot at one of their arenas and they just had providers come in all day long and they vaccinated about 2000 people in a day. Um, expanding access to Head Start and Early Head Start, a number of states have done that, including Arizona. Increasing scholarships for providers. So this is a really important one. As, as Megan talked about, we have a lot of providers who are um, moving out of our space that are struggling to get jobs um, and making sure that they have the training and the skills necessary to do the job well, to make sure they're taking care of young kids in, with developmentally appropriate practice. States can really contribute to that by increasing the availability of scholarships that will help them get access to training, will get access to community college and two and four year colleges and universities. And a number of states, including Wisconsin, have done that. Megan also referenced the deep cost in mental health that our providers and our children are facing as a result of the pandemic. And we hope that a number of states will use some of the funds from the American Rescue Plan to invest in mental health consultation for providers and families. And we've already seen this in a number of states. Um, quite a few states have mental health consultation for the childcare field and Kansas and the District of Columbia have done some work using some of their emergency relief funds to continue those services. Family child care networks, investing in child care resource and referral, not just to communicate with families in this emergency, in this difficult time for all, but to provide translation for providers and families to access services and subsidies, to provide technical assistance as providers are applying for funds, um, and in many other ways to be a support for providers. And we've seen that in a number of ways. In New Hampshire, the state gave funds to resource and referral agencies to both be an emergency hotline, but also to serve as a space to distribute those PPE materials and to other um, health and safety materials that providers needed at no cost. Wage increases, this is a really, really big and important one that we've seen a number of states adopt over the year of the pandemic. Um, in which the state provides funds either directly to classroom teachers and providers or mandates that an increase in, in subsidy funds that go to the provider must make their way to the pockets of the providers, of the teachers in the classroom. And we saw quite a few states do that in a number of ways. Um, a number of states paid on a per child basis, a number on a paid, Connecticut paid up to $825 per week. Um, New Mexico, North Carolina had a mechanism that they were sending dollars directly to the classroom teacher or to the family child care provider. Georgia is trying to do that right now. In Maine, uh, the way that they got more dollars directly to teachers and um, other providers was to incentivize them to uh, sign up for the state professional registry 
um, which was a way of making sure that they were in line for the vaccine, but also gave them an additional bonus for signing up. Um, so there's lots of different ways that states have invested in compensation directly for our providers so that they are not, uh, so that they are rewarded, they are compensated appropriately for being in the classroom, for providing family child care, for being open during this incredibly difficult time. And a number of states across the country invested in direct grants to stabilize providers and fully funded their costs. The primary programs that did this were in Illinois and Minnesota, but across the country, we saw smaller programs to do that. And it is important to note the American Rescue Plan includes $24 billion for states to provide stabilization grants. And those can be given to cover all operating expenses of providers. And I'm happy to talk more about that during the questions if there are, um, if there's any questions. Um, and across the country, we've already seen 24 states that were doing that with their own funds. Let's see here. I want my computer go to the next slide. Hold on. There we go. So thinking about longer term policy changes, we really want to think about how to change the subsidy system so that it is more responsive to the needs of children, families, and providers, and that it is not burdensome for families to enter the system so that it is really, really a space where families get what they need to be successful, to be able to go to work, to make sure that their children are taken care of, are safe, and are getting developmentally appropriate care. And the primary way to do that is to address the system itself by increasing eligibility, raising rates across the board, and eliminating or lowering co-payments and other parent fees. And we've already seen a number of states start to do these things. We saw this in Arizona, um, which eliminated the redetermination period during the uh, COVID crisis so that families that were in the system just stayed in the system. They didn't have to report any changes. They didn't have to do anything. Colorado increased its eligibility to 85% of the state median income during this period. And Missouri, while it didn't increase eligibility across the board, did invest in job search childcare so that families who had become unemployed during the crisis had knew that they could get childcare while they continued to search for work. Um, we saw a number of states eliminate or lower co-payments, and 32 states did that, including most of the mid-Atlantic states around New Jersey. Um, and some of those were short-term. In Washington state, it was originally for three months. And in other states, it was across the time period of the COVID crisis. And so you can really see that there are ways to change what's going on with families. Importantly, under that $24 million for stabilization, one of the, primary, one of the requirements in the federal law is that if states give a grant to a provider for stabilizing them to continue to provide services, those providers must waive fees through the period of that grant. So really thinking about those foundational supports and how to change the system. We're also hoping that states will think very differently about how families access the subsidy in the first place by creating contracts to meet the needs of families and providers. Contracts can provide stability to a provider by paying for a certain number of slots and guaranteeing those funds. Um, and a number of states have done this in the past and several states, including Wisconsin, use the, are using the funds in the American Rescue Plan and the CRRSA to do that. In Wisconsin, they are providing very specific contracts to identify and build the supply for infants and toddlers through a number of relationships and through partnership with businesses so that they're targeting the need for infant and toddler, uh, toddler slots with the places where businesses are hiring in response to um, some of the COVID crisis issues. Making sure you have data about the needs of families to identify gaps and address equity. Many of you, um, Megan has been a very uh, big part of this. Many of you know that NAYC was doing surveys of providers throughout the COVID crisis. And a number of those were state specific surveys that identified what was going on at the state level. Coordination with other systems, including Child Find, as we talked about, because there are now increased funds available for IDA, making sure that we have people in the field that are identifying families that need to be attached to the early intervention system, working with pediatricians to provide de developmental assessments, and supporting transition of children from early childhood into, into school. In Nebraska, they have used some of their state money to invest in summer programs um, and to connect kids, to get, connect early childhood providers with schools. Importantly, those large amounts of money for K-12 that I highlighted on an earlier slide from the American Rescue Plan, those funds include very specific set-asides that the state and local communities must use for summer programs this summer, for after-school programs, 
and to address learning loss, which is defined as academic, social, and emotional supports for children. So in each of these areas where the state or the local school districts have their own money, there are potential connections and funding available to support early childhood. I'm gonna go on to the next slide and really talk about opportunities for advocacy at the state level. Um, so as we think about what we wanna do, as we think about all those options for state uh, actions to improve access to subsidies for families, to help providers get access to the funding they need to be stable, there are several questions that we wanna ask. So really, as you're thinking about your advocacy with the state and indeed also with your local community and your school districts, we need to understand what data is needed to tell the story, what supports are needed in our local community to make sure that funds are used quickly, that they are effective and that they are used equitably. Um, we have often seen that families in under-resourced communities, providers of color are the last in line to get helped. And we wanna make sure that these funds really address those systemic inequities that have um, long characterized the early childhood system. Really thinking about how to help the state do this work this is a lot of money coming into state agencies in a very short period of time. So how can we, the advocacy community, really build the capacity to make sure these dollars get out the door? Are there intermediary organizations that are prepared to help get grants out the door? Are there folks that can help advise the state and provide the data that they need to do some of the analysis? What are the ways that we can build capacity to make sure these funds get out the door? And then finally, really thinking across the state about what works where are there pilots that could be expanded? What hasn't worked? What could be changed? Where are the significant um, best practices in place that we really know stabilize providers, really support children and families, provide those connections across systems, make sure the providers are appreciated and well compensated. Where are we already doing that that we can build on that? And as you're thinking for your advocacy about trying to understand where the state is, and <clears throat> Natasha is going to talk about this, um, some of the state actions, as is Cynthia. But you can you can get information as well. So there are state plans in place for a number of the different funds, including the most the December money. Your preschool development grant application and implementation plan has lots and lots of activities and outlines the strategic plan for the state and includes a needs assessment. You have in your state funds to do an infant toddler strategic plan, which also highlights what is needed. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about the state plan for childcare subsidies. So every state is required to fund, to file a state plan for their childcare subsidy program. Those state plans right now are, um, are in development and are due in July. And they require that your state have a stakeholder in a stakeholder process where they get input from people across the state. And this is an enormous opportunity to help the state think about long-term how to radically change the childcare system to be responsive to the needs of children and families. So these are some ideas for what you might wanna be thinking about, about to make that happen. And all those ideas I put on before about long and short, medium and long-term strategies, this is a place where you can embed them in your state's long-term plan and make sure that they are, are taking hold, that they're permanently in place and that they are part of the vision of the state moving forward. So you can see on the slide some suggestions for how to do that, identifying the priorities. So making sure you're not just one voice saying, hey, this is important, but making sure that stakeholders across the state have similar priorities for what should happen and what needs to change. Gather data, as I talked about, there have been a number of surveys um, at the state and local level about what's going on, but you all have data at hand. Where are the children who have asthma? Where are the children who are not being connected to the early, early intervention? Where are the homeless children who are not getting access? Where are those providers who, have, um, who are going to Costco instead of coming into our programs? What's happening to the programs? You have quantitative data, you have stories to tell. Make sure you, connect, you collect those and connect them to your legislature, legislators and your state administrators. Make sure you're sitting at that stakeholder table and including parents and providers and, and finding ways to make sure that parents and providers can be supported to participate, both through the timing of meetings and also through funding for transportation, um, childcare and other pieces. And make sure that anytime there's a public hearing that you are submitting testimony. Sometimes it seems really scary to think you're gonna talk about what you need, 
That is our job. Let's let's shout from the rooftops about what childcare needs to make sure that we are a system of care for all children and families. This is our time and our opportunity to really dramatically shift what the childcare system looks like. There is a significant amount of money coming into the state. It is short-term dollars, but that does not mean that it is temporary. This is our time to create foundational systemic change that will make sure that children, families, providers who are in the system today have everything they need to make sure that we can all be successful tomorrow. So I thank you for inviting me and I look forward to answering questions. And I'm going to turn it over to Natasha for her presentation. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, everybody. And thank you to Danielle. Um, again, my name is Natasha Johnson and I'm the Assistant Commissioner of the Division of Family Development in the New Jersey Department of Human Services. And what I'd like to talk to you about this morning is um, how New Jersey used the various pots of money that Danielle just spoke about. So I'd like to take you back to March of 2020. Can't believe it's been already a year since we've been in this situation. Uh, but the governor issued an executive order that mandated centers to close um, a year ago in March of 2020. The first thing we did was begin to prepay our providers based on enrollment versus attendance um, in March of 2020. Between the March closure dates for centers and the beginning of April, we created and implemented an emergency childcare program for essential employees. Uh, this program had a standard special rate that was higher than our subsidy rate and was open to all essential employees identified in the governor's executive order that were in need of childcare. The emergency childcare program operated from April to June of 2020 and served just under 12,000 children. It was operated um, by 500 to 700 centers, um, and that number fluctuated in those couple of months based on the needs of parents. We also made health and safety uh, cleaning and stabilization grants available to providers, whether they were centers or family childcare providers in those early months, regardless of whether they accepted subsidy or not. That first round of grants, centers were able to apply for $10,000 uh, and family childcare providers $2,000 and we processed approximately 2,400 applications in that first round. Also during the early months, we provided PPE to centers and family childcare providers. Because as you'll remember, even though we were providing these stabilization grants, there were some difficulties in getting the PPE. So we did distribute the PPE that we had accessible to us at that time. Also during this period of time when the centers were closed, we gave family childcare providers an extra $100 a child in addition to the subsidy payment, if they stayed open and were caring for children. Um, because the centers had to, were closed between March and June and we wanted to make sure that providers had some options and family childcare providers were not mandated to close. Um, I also just wanna point out that, so pre-pandemic uh, in January of 2020, we reduced co-pays by 50% for all of our parents. And then during the pandemic, we waived co-pays for families who could not afford them. So they could reach out to their child care resource and referral agencies if they were struggling with that, uh, the 50% of the copay that remained for them to pay. And we would pay that to the providers if they were unable to do so. The governor issued another executive order that allowed centers to reopen on June 15th of 2020. Um, right around that time, the Department of Children and Families, which is our sister agency, um, released new licensing standards to address some of the pandemic concerns. At that point, we did another couple of rounds of grants. Um, so one was a smaller health and safety grant in June of 2020, that was 5,000 per center and 2,000 for camps. And then we did a second round of grants that were stabilization grants. These grants were designed to help childcare centers and family childcare programs meet the increased cost of reopening or remaining open during the public health emergency. The grants which were available to providers that were open or would open by October 1st were intended to help with the, some of the things that came out in the DCF um, new standards and just all the COVID-19 health and safety grants. These grants range from 8,000 to 7,000 for licensed childcare centers um, based on the center's capacity and $2,500 for registered family childcare providers. We processed stabilization grants for over 2,200 centers and 915 family childcare providers. So those three rounds of grants um, sort of got us through the summer. And then in September, we um, had the coronavirus relief funds that came into the state that we were able to use to start a few additional 
uh, child care related programs to support parents and providers. Some were specifically to address the variation in school openings across the state. Um, so the first was the tuition assistance program. So this was a program for non-subsidy eligible school aged children whose parents had an income up to $150,000 a year. They were able to apply for this tuition assistance and get that money to pay for supervision for their children um, if their schools were remote or um, or uh, virtual, uh, not virtual, I'm sorry, uh, hybrid, couldn't get to the word hybrid. Um, the second initiative was um, we continue to um, provide subsidy, port, subsidy support by paying providers based on enrollment and not intended since March. So that continued. From March to October, we paid based on enrollment, whether the provider was open or not. Then beginning in October, we only paid for providers that were open. So we did make a change on October 1st if the provider was close. The third initiative was for school age subsidy children. So in our pre-pandemic world, um, subsidy children only required part-time agreements for the subsidy program because they were in school during the day and only needed before and after care. During the pandemic, parents were in need of full-time care because of the school openings. Um, so we were able to provide that support for our school aid subsidy children. And then the fourth initiative was we provided supplemental payments to providers. So they received $300 per month per child for um, at the discretion of the providers to address whatever needs they had. So they could push that money down to staff if they wanted to increase um, salary for staff, make repairs, buy additional PPE, uh, do upgrades, whatever they needed to do, but they received that additional subsidy, uh, supplemental payment for all of their subsidy children. And then Danielle mentioned the Consolidated Appropriations Act uh, that was signed in December. So that allowed us to continue several of these COVID-19 child care initiatives that I just mentioned um, through June. So um, there were a number. One is the tuition assistance for families making up to $150,000 a year. That will continue through June. And that is for families that were already enrolled in that program. We will continue to carry them forward. We're also continuing through June, the school age uh, subsidy children who need a full-time agreement um, because of schools remote learning. We're also continuing the supplemental payments. So providers will continue to get $300 per full-time child per month, um, and then $150 per child per month through June. And then we will, with this new round of money, continue to pay based on enrollment instead of attendance through June. Uh, the other thing that happened is that in January, we were able to provide a subsidy rate increase to address the minimum wage increase that went into effect on January 1st. So as Danielle mentioned a couple of times in her presentation, um, these are one-time funds that are short-term. So we were very excited to get the amount of money that we did into the state, and we will continue to support the provider community and families for as long as we can, and are excited to get the details from ACF on the American Rescue Plan, you know, as we move forward. A couple of other things I just want to add is, um, Danielle showed a slide about the American Rescue Plan that talked about pandemic EBT. Um, that comes out of our division, so you'll hear some information on it. Um, going forward because now the eligibility has been extend, expanded to children who are on SNAP that are in child care centers. Um, so more information to come on that as well. And uh, we're also excited about the SNAP increases for families that were rescue plan as well. And I also just want to briefly mention that we have continued providing scholarships um, to staff in child care centers and family child care um, homes. So that continues. Our mental health consultation also continues and we have invested in shared services that will continue um, and expand as we move forward. So we're excited to be able to continue those things and also to add the new things that this um, new money has uh, allowed us to be able to do. So I just wanna briefly give some information on the child care state plan. Uh, Danielle mentioned uh, on her last couple of slides. So we have received the plan details from the federal government and we are the agency responsible for putting that child care state plan together. So when we get those instructions from the feds, it requires us to do take a look at our internal policies, our regulations and statutes, and how we're implementing the program. So that's the process that we're currently in right now. And we're doing that in partnership with our colleagues at the Department of Children and Families and the Department of Health, because they have roles in how we implement our programs as well. So we will be announcing here in the near future, uh, the public hearing that Danielle referenced. Um, the plan will be posted prior to 
uh, that public hearing, and that is your opportunity to provide us with feedback. We very much look forward to that, um, and I'm looking forward to getting your participation in our public mm -hmm. hearing and providing that information to us. So at this point, I will transition to Cindy, who's going to talk about advocacy opportunities. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Cynthia Rice from Advocates for Children in New Jersey, and I, I just want to, two things. I have to take care of a housekeeping issue that our that my colleague Catherine Fileggi just said, please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. So we'll follow them. Um, I think it's a little easier to follow, so please do that. So I wanna take a pause just to say, wow, there's been so much information, um, so much great information. And it's an exciting up, it's an exciting time. So I wanna talk a few minutes about, we're gonna shift a little bit to what's going on in our state regarding the state budget. And then we're going to shift back to um, some federal advocacy. So on top of all this federal work, we're in the midst of New Jersey's state budget uh, process. Several weeks ago, as Seal mentioned earlier, the governor announced um, his proposed budget for the fiscal year 2022 that if passed into law will provide significant supports to schools, to public health, to childcare, and tax assistance for families to minimize the impact of the pandemic um, now and in the months ahead. Just, I just wanna highlight a couple of the areas. First, there's $50 million proposed for preschool expansion. 26 million of that 50 million would go to new districts who are eligible, that are eligible and could expand our nationally recognized state funded program. The, the remaining $24 million would go to expand existing programs. Um, there's money to make the child care tax, uh, the, the, child, the child dependent ca uh, care tax credit refundable and expand that credit to families um, at $150,000 $150, and below of their, of their, um, their income. There's a new cover all kids initiative, which would change eligibility, waiting lists, premiums, and outreach to reach 90,000 children who remain uninsured in our state. <clears throat> there is an en enrollment in a child care subsidy program expected to increase, and there's funding to offset some of the costs due to the minimum wage increase. Natasha just mentioned that. There's also proposed $5 million in a child care pilot funding to pay for facilities improvements for child care, and a portion of that money was is to go for shared services. And there's about $8.5 million proposed to extend Medicaid coverage to 365 days for postpartum mothers. And that's part of our First Ladies Nurture New, Jer New Jersey um, initiative. So where do we go with all this? Hopefully, many of you have already have signed up to provide either oral or written testimony before our two state budget committees, that's the Assembly and the Senate, on why this funding is so critical and why there may be other areas that need to be um, considered in our budget. Um, it's it's um, unfortunately, it appears that signups to testify right now before both committees are now closed, that, which is a positive and a, and a negative. If you were waiting to sign up, it might be too late. If on the positive side, it means that lots of people already signed up. Um, the last two opportunities to testify are actually Monday and Tuesday um, of next week. And it, it appears that the website um, the hearings are at capacity. But that doesn't mean that your advocacy should stop on the state budget. You can reach out to the members of the budget committee and you can reach out to your own state legislators. That's your state senator and your two members of the assembly to let them ha know how important certain funds are to your program, to your children that you work with and the families, <clears throat> particularly at this time when programs and families and program, uh, programs and families continue to struggle. I tell you that there are no mind readers in the New Jersey legislature. They don't know unless someone tells them. So it's critically important that you provide information to them about why these funds are, are necessary. So and now I just wanna go back <clears throat> to the federal dollars. President Biden said this week that the American Rescue Plan um, included the largest investment in childcare since World War II. That is an incredible comment. Um, whoever thought, as, as pretty much everybody has said this morning, whoever thought that when all is said and done, all of the stimulus packages are added up and our, our, our regular funding that we would have gotten had, um, had there not been um, a, a, 
a um, pandemic that it would be, as Daniel said, Danielle said, somewhere close to a billion dollars for New Jersey. And after years of underfunding, this is more than most of us could have ever imagined. So I, I think it's not unfair to say that <clears throat> this is both a moment in time and an opportunity we have to take um, the most advantage of. While the, the dollar figure is a dream come true, how these dollars are spent is not only important to get us through the pandemic, but how, as many of us have so often said, how do we build back better? We may never see such an infusion of federal money in our, in our state or any other state. And I know that everyone on this call wants us to use the funding in ways that is best possible, stabilizes and strengthens the overall system now and in the future. But there is a difference between stabilizing the system and getting the system back to where it was. As bad as things are, and have, and have been during this last year, I don't think any childcare provider wants to go back to how things were in March of 2020. This funding, as well as other funding streams, as Danielle talked about, provides us with an opportunity to begin to solve both short and long-term problems so that as a state, we can minimize the chances of returning to this the childcare system that existed pre-pandemic. That means, as Daniel also said, using existed, existing data to allow us to make informed short and long-term policy decisions, coming up with solutions on how best to invest in the workforce. We can't um, underscore how important that is. Ensure quality programs for all children, but particularly for infants and toddlers, where we know that there's the, the greatest need, provide mental health supports for children and families, and doing it all through an equity lens. Each of us participating today in this child care conversation comes to the day table with a different perspective. Time and circumstance over the last year has provided us all with unique experiences. And as many of you are on the first line of defense, you best understand what supports have helped and what needs you and your family still have. Over the next few months, I urge you to take advantage of any and all opportunities to provide input as our state reimagines childcare. This includes participating in our state budget process, even if it's, if it's closed down for oral testimony. Don't hesitate to send to your legislators, to our budget committee, what you think has to be said, or participate, as, as Natasha talked about, in the, in the CCDBG plan and the hearing. Let your voice be heard. This is the only way to ensure the development of a stable childcare system that supports programs, children and families, as well as helps move our state economy forward through, uh, through towards recovery. And I just wanna end with one more thought. <clears throat> the work of the childcare community did not become essential on March 20th, 20, 20, uh, 2020. It and you have always been essential to families, to children, and to our economy. Just ask any working mother who's staying home now, trying to care for and educate their child while working. It and you have always been essential to these families. It just became more obvious over the last year. So please don't underestimate the importance of what you have to say and don't hesitate in taking a place at the planning table, just as Danielle had said, to help strengthen New Jersey's childcare system. So I wanna pass this back on to, uh, back to Cecilia, so that we can talk a little bit about some of the questions that you have. Cecilia? Okay, I'm gonna ask um, that Catherine uh, bring up the panelists. Um, thank you all. There are many, many questions, both in the chat and in the Q and A. Um, I've tried to monitor them. And what we'd like to do is have a, a conversation uh, that I can raise with each of the panelists, but also ask other panelists if they have something to add to join. First, I just want to address the many, many questions we had about where to get information. So specifically on this information, both the recording and the slides that Danielle presented will be available to you after the recording. Usually what we do is send them out to people who are registered for the webinar and then post them on our website. So we will make them available to you. Um, second, a lot of information, a lot of questions about where to get information about the budget process, about opportunities for input into the CCDF plan. Um, ACNJ is committed one 
aspect of our advocacy is to make sure that you all know when and how to advocate, when you can raise your voice. So we are committed to getting out that information. Uh, steps along the budget process, the state budget process, as Cindy raised, uh, you know, the budget hearings are almost done, but there'll be opportunities from now to June to reach out to your legislators. Issues will come up during the budget process. We will keep you informed. Someone raised a question about how do they know who's on the budget committee? We will get that information out to you. Uh, we have a pretty extensive list of child care <laughs> advocates who we communicate with and we will add you uh, to that list and you can always check out our website because any information we put out is also on our website at www.acnj.org and i just want to echo um, a comment that cindy made about the budget process which i think is relevant to the discussion at this committee uh, at, the, at this whole not the committee at this whole webinar i think that this the federal funding is incredible and it does provide the opportunity to stabilize the system. I think Natasha's presentation on what the state has done with the CARES Act funding um, is very significant and also lends itself to where do we wanna go in the future. But ultimately, as everyone has pointed out, those federal funds are short term, at least the additional federal funds. So this is also an opportunity to continue to keep the drumbeat up about the importance of childcare, the impact on you as providers or as parents, childcare stakeholders. At some point now, our state has to match this. So I think raising the issue about the state's role does not disappear uh, because of this additional federal funding. We have to build in the argument that if we're gonna really transform the system, it has to come with a, a state commitment too. And it's not too soon to tell our legislators that. As Cindy pointed out, there's, uh, I think, some great uh, advances in the state budget. As Natasha pointed out, the state has committed to increasing subsidy to address the minimum wage. That was a significant uh, achievement two years ago. Um, but it is a time to talk about what we might need in the future or just the fact that the state needs to be committed. Um, that there were a couple of specific questions. I've tried to monitor both the Q&A and the chat. I know other ACNJ staff members have been on. I'm not sure we're going to get to everything, but we're going to try. There was a more specific question about information. And I'm going to just direct this to Natasha. If someone wants to know about grants that are available, about additional funding that's put out, how is that communicated direct to the field? Um, so what we have done in the last year to communicate that to the field is We've put information on our website, which is um, childcarenj.gov, but we've also sent direct communications to providers um, through the Workforce Registry and NJCCIS. And the CCRNRs have also pushed information out. We've had flyers and brochures just to make sure that we have getting that information out to everyone. So I would always go back and check our website. There's, and if you don't have the information on the child care resource and referral agencies in your county, that information is on our website as well. But also make sure that you're registered in the registry and all that information gets directly sent to you through the, the workforce registry. Great. Thank you, Natasha. And I noticed that Dani uh, from the ACNJ staff put the information, the link to the website um, in the chat. Um, so thank you. Second, Natasha, I'm just going to continue with there are many questions about whether the stabilization aid or the stabilization grants would continue. So we're still in the process of working through. Um, so when Danielle mentioned the American Rescue Plan, we're still waiting on specific information from the feds about our allocation for the state, specific criteria around how that can be used. So I, I can't tell you now that that will happen. I'm sure there's going to be another round of grants, but we're waiting to understand how much money we're getting specifically from the feds. And so more information will come out on that shortly. Good. Thank you. Um, many questions about specific uses of the funds um, and keeping in mind uh, Natasha's comment that the, the uh, guidance is not out yet from the feds. I'm just going to ask Danielle, a couple of issues that came up, whether you have any insight as to whether this has the potential to be included in the funding. Several questions about facilities. Uh, can this funding be used to improve, renovate, or expand facilities? So um, I will, um, it's a very complicated question and you all don't want my complicated answer. So I'm gonna try and be as straightforward as possible. So most of the rules of the federal child care 
subsidy program, the child care and development block grant still apply to these dollars. And the dollars can't be used for major facility repair and redesign or building. They can be used for minor re renovations to meet health and safety standards and do things like that. So no, you can't use these dollars, the CCBG dollars to, to build a whole new center. That is not allowed. Um, but yes, you can use the dollars to potentially, if the state gives grants in this way, to do things like build fences, build um, uh, increase um, emergency exits, um, raise, raise the, increase the facility to meet quality standards, whether that means um, in, in, uh, putting a sink in. A number of states to that end used some of the emergency stabilization dollars that we've already had to help providers buy things that would make it easier to do health and safety. So dishwashers, additional sinks, additional hand washing stations, additional diaper changing stations. Um, so those kind of renovations can be paid for with these dollars. On the stabilization grant side, those dollars cannot be used for facilities. They are for operating expenses um, and to address the costs of dealing with the pandemic, which might include some of those minor things I just talked about, include in like sinks and other things. But these are not funds that are going to be dramatically expanding the size or the availability of centers and um, other classrooms. I will say that there are a number of proposals at the federal level to actually do that. Yesterday, um, Representative Clark from Massachusetts introduced her bill, Child Care is Infrastructure. I believe that's the name, that is $10 billion for facilities expansion. And there are a number of organizations that are uh, helping her move that through Congress. We are hopeful that that will make it into a um, federal package later this summer, but I can't promise you. So there will be opportunities to advocate at the federal level for facilities funds that are up and coming, that are actually real. Whereas in previous years, they might've been a nice message bill, but weren't gonna go anywhere. Representative Clark's bill may have a chance to move through Congress this year. And Steele, can I just add to that quickly that um, we have in the past with the grants that we put out in the last year, tried to be very clear in the application process because Danielle's right. Usually we are not able to do major capital improvements, um, but we also provided some technical support to providers because they, you know, we can't think of every single thing. So they may apply for the grant and put in specifically what they're looking for. And then we would yay or nay that depending on what is allowable. So uh, that will be the same process going forward that we'll try to be as clear as we can in the description, but always allow for people to propose some of the things that they may want or need to do. And then we will um, make a decision about whether it's allowable for them to do that or not. Great, thank you. Um, there are a number of uh, individual questions about particular um, things that are allowable or not. And I understand that without the guidance, you can't answer those, but there were several questions about the faith-based community. And would this, aid be open to the faith-based community that's providing childcare? Natasha. So it, I think that's a hard question to answer without having some specifics. Um, in the, and I don't know if the rules will be the same as they were on the consolidated um, dollars that we got in December, but for that money, you still had to meet um, the requirements of CCDBG, meaning you still were licensed or registered, had to get background checks, had to have the training in place. So there, so again, I think until we get some details about this, um, it's hard to answer that question specifically. Great, thank you, Natasha. Um, there were also a number of questions uh, about the circumstances of childcare providers who are contracting with school districts to provide pre-K. And I know that's an issue that, that uh, we have worked on. Um, Cindy, I'm gonna ask you if you have any thoughts on that. Sure, I mean, the one, the one thing that we do know was that school districts are, um, were required to continue to pay uh, contracting providers at what they, what was in the contract. They were, con were supposed to continue and not what the attendance was. So if that is an issue, um, that, that would completely, first it would be the district would not be in compliance if that's what's happening. This focus for the childcare money, obviously there's a huge chunk for, um, um, uh, CCDBG, those who are, provide subsidy. And, and I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if, if, um, 
if stabilization aid, I would assume that it could in certain circumstances, if you if there is a loss, if a provider who is contracting with a school district uh, experiences a loss, could apply as a, you know, similar to a, a private pay provider. Some the issues are there. There are losses that you've had to have additional, you've had additional costs. So I would assume that you would be able to take advantage of those opportunities as as other child care programs have. I would just add yeah. the grants that we put out before, you did not have to be um, serving subsidy kids to apply for those. Right. And more detail will come out as we learn the specifics going forward. And I'll just add that um, yes to all the things that Cynthia and Natasha said about whether and how pre-K providers are included in the child care money, they should also be included in how state the state education agency and local education agency, your school districts, are thinking about their dollar usage. Um, whether it's summer programs for pre-K kids, whether it's making sure that those children and their families are included in any transition activities that are happening over the summer, making sure that those providers are included in any um, opportunities to, for increased funding for teachers um, to do anything to improve the quality of the classrooms. Those school districts have quite a bit of money. Yes, they have to be spread across all the K-12 grades and all the kids in a community, but our kids are part of that community. And treating pre-K like it's not part of their systems isn't going to benefit them in the long run. So really making sure that you're at the table and for those conversations as well will be really important. Great. Thank you, Danielle. I think a very Good point. Um, there was one specific question about access to the uh, preschool development grant. And I just wanted to clarify that that is a grant that the state received to develop, strengthen its preschool through uh, age five system, not preschool, sorry, infant through age five system. It's not an individual grant that goes out to um, providers. I just wanted that's to- correct. That was one question I could answer. So I just yeah, no, that's correct. <laughs> Um, Danielle, I wanted to ask you, I, I, I don't think this came up directly um, in our conversation this morning, but I want to go back to the second round of the Payroll Protection Act funds. I know that in the original CARES Act, ensuring that child care providers could access those funds was uh, critical. Uh, I think it was very difficult in the beginning. I think there were efforts made to try and work with providers to access those funds. Can you make any comments about this second round and whether child care, what, what child care providers can do? Yeah, thanks for raising that, Seal. Um, so a couple of things. So the Paycheck Protection Program was extended in the December bill and some of the deadlines were actually recently extended by the Biden administration. Um, importantly, in the December bill, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, there's special language that says that targets small businesses to have access to the Paycheck Protection Program. And the Biden administration put out additional guidance to banks and other financial institutions, encouraging them to really, really, really prioritize small businesses, at least in the first part of um, the access to the dollars. We've seen some of that have an actual effect, and I think that has been great. It is important to note though, that what many providers needed in addition to access to the financial institutions was help understanding how to pull together their financial materials. And we know that's gonna be an issue as well as the states develop their stabilization grant programs with that 24 million for stabilization. And because of that, Congress included in the allowable uses of funds for, and actually it's required use of funds um, under the stabilization grant that the state must help must provide technical assistance to providers to help them gather the materials and information to apply for those grants. And it's our hope that that will actually position our providers well to apply for other grants and loans from financial institutions, including the PPE. Megan, did you wanna add something about that? If you could just give me the question again, I had to, I lost the internet for a second. So just bring me back up to context. We were talking about the second round of the payroll protection funds and whether child care providers can access that and how. So child care providers can access the second draw of the PPP. Um, there, It's still very similar. I actually just went through this process. It's very similar to the first draw, although we do know more as child care providers now, whereas when we did it in April, we didn't, this was a realm that we had never really had to tap into. Um, we know a little bit more about the forgiveness and the thresholds and of what, when 
what will be 100% forgiven um, and what may not and what's easily forgiven. But child care providers very much are being seen as that small business as far as the PPP and are able to apply now for that second draw. And if you received a loan in the first round, you are not precluded from applying for a second loan. Um, So I just want to mention here that we have two uh, funders on the call. I think they're still on the call, Barbara Reisman and Melissa Litwin, who funded an initiative during the first round of the PPE loans to help providers apply. Um, They contracted with Civitas Strategies and Gary Romano to work directly with providers. But what has come out of that has is some guidance that Gary has shared. Um, we have put that out once. Gary shared that with us about a month ago, but ACNJ will be happy to get that out. I think there's a lot of guidance in there about how to understand and access this process. Some of it, I think, came from the work that Gary and Civitas Strategies did with individual providers, both child care center and family child care providers. So we'll be happy to provide more information on that. I think the first round of the funds, very difficult. It was a confusing time. Um, <clears throat> people were applying, banks were not even aware. Uh, you know, relationships with banks were important, but I think there many programs succeeded in the fact that this is being made available again. Um, and hopefully in a way that makes it easier to access, I think is important to mention. I'm gonna ask any of the other panelists if you have anything to add on this issue. So I just put two resources into the chat and I think it's important to point out that family child care providers are eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program. It's not just for centers. And Tom Copeland, who's long been an advocate working with um, family child care has done very specific resources for how those folks can apply. And I just dropped those in the chat. Great. And I noticed that Barbara Reisman has added to the chat. Uh, It was not just Mar and uh, the Todd Foundation, but also the Burke and Nicholson Foundations that supported this TA and some funding from the New Jersey Pandemic Relief Fund has helped to fund the work to provide TA to child care providers. And it's brought over $4 million to providers so far. So I think this is a, a really an important initiative. And Gary has reached out to us a number of times with guidance that he is, wants us to share with all of you. We will get that out to you as well. Um, I Many of the other questions that came up were fairly individual, but I did want to go back to what was a theme around workforce. Um, Megan, you set the context for that when we started the webinar. Um, and I think that as we look to both the short-term and long-term issues around how we strengthen the system, the issue of compensation for the workforce is the elephant in the room. Um, And I know that there are some ideas that are put out there. Uh, Danielle shared what other states are doing in terms of direct uh, bonuses, grants um, to staff. I just wonder, I wanna open it up and ask the, the panel, any other ideas? Because I think this is an issue that many of us have talked about for years and years. This is a workforce that is undercompensated. We've known that. Uh, We haven't been able to address it, but how do we seize this opportunity to advance the the workforce issues? I'm going to start with Cindy because she is heading a workforce compensation committee as part of our Think Babies initiative. And some ideas have come out of that. And there's been some discussion about state legislation. Cindy? Thanks, Seal. You know, I we, we talk to a lot of providers and um, Megan and I have participated in a lot of um, congressional Zoom calls uh, that, that happened both early on after the CARES Act uh, was, was funded and then just recently talking about the need for the, the funding for the rescue plan. In every call, there has a, the provider, and what we've tried to do is make sure that the providers were um, from the congressional district in every call. So the reason why I bring this up was, is that it was statewide. The issue was statewide. It wasn't an urban issue. It wasn't a suburban issue. Or everyone said, I can't find staff. 
And uh, I remember uh, on one call with, uh, I believe, Congressman Norcross's office where Keisha Wright Daniel from who runs a, uh, a program in Pensacola and said it is the first time in her 20 odd years that she put an, uh, you know, um, advertised for a position that she received not one call on. This is telling us something is, is that, as Megan said, we can, you know, we can increase the subsidy. All of that is important. But if there's no staff, there's no child care. And so we, uh, our group, the work group committee that um, comes out of, uh, of uh, Pritzker work, our Pritzker work, as well as um, our a, a teach, we work with the teach group. One of the, the short-term approach we're trying to do is to get legislation that will provide a refundable tax credit, not even based on education, which is what, what many states have done, but looks at the income of our, of our child care community. And it would, um, would allow them to apply for a refundable tax credit that at the lower amount of funding, at the lower amount of money you make, the higher the refundable tax credit. And it even... Um, includes an incentive for those who educate and care our youngest children, our infants and toddlers, so that refundable tax credit would be higher. There seems to be a lot of interest in this from the legislative uh, community who is hearing from their constituents about I, they can't find that that um, there's lots of problems both from their own providers to a, to parents. So that's just the short term, but we have to look at the bigger system because even when we talk about um, increasing, let's say the, the um, subsidy rate and having it linked to um, link to a portion of it going to the compensation of the staff, we have to think that there, we have a huge component of our overall system that are programs just like Megan's that don't have subsidy families or um, that, that don't. So how are they paying them? We can't look at this and put it on the backs of families to pay because you know what happens? They can't pay it. And so either they remove their kids from five days to three days to what they can afford. This is not how we secure the stabilize the system. So looking at not only this funding, but recognizing what, that we have to come up with a, a mechanism to fund. And that's, and, that, and this is, you know, frankly, it is a federal issue, but it's also a state issue because this is a group that's been deemed an essential service. We have to treat it like an essential service. So looking at getting state money, um, recognizing this issue, but we could start with the short term and looking at one, that bill, and two, how can we creatively use these federal dollars to at least for now begin to address this issue? And we will um, certainly keep you informed as that legislation is introduced and begins to move through the legislature. It probably will not be for a couple of months because the legislature is now meeting on the budget process. I see that Danielle has put in the chat a link to a range of state policy options to support the workforce, including compensation and benefits. Danielle, is there anything you want to highlight in that? Yeah, I wanted to say a couple of things because I think this, as, as Cynthia said, this is a, there's some short-term solutions, but this is a short, medium, and long-term problem, right? So we need to think about all the places we can do that, and compensation is one of the biggest. But there's other things that are keeping our providers um, from staying in the field, from being part of the field, particularly our Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who are part of, um, who we want to be part of the childcare community. So really thinking about what are some of the small things we can do to make people feel welcome in our field? Are we translating all materials so that providers understand how to be part of the subsidy system and families know how to be part of the subsidy system? Is TA available to help those folks apply for, you know, become part of those systems and apply for quality dollars and other things? These are small things but sometimes that can make a big difference. And then really thinking about some of the medium and long-term changes to how we recruit and retain our providers, right? As I said at the very beginning of my presentation, there's a lot of money for higher education in the American Rescue Plan. How are we making sure some of that is going to the development of um, uh, the childcare field of the future, right? How are we making sure that we're incentivizing our colleges and universities to provide scholarships and appropriate educational paths for early childhood teachers so that the, we, we have folks in the pool going forward and that we're focusing on teachers who represent the, the children in our communities. So there's a lot of things we need to do along the way to address 
the long-term problems of our field. And I, I don't mean to diminish in any way the need to put compensation first and foremost, and we need to get a handle on that. But we also need to be thinking about whether we have a pool for the future, because as Lorraine Cook put into the chat, she's been looking for a pre-K teacher for a year. How do we make sure that there are folks who are ready and willing to take those jobs? Great. Thank you, Danielle. Anyone else want to add anything to the compensation issue? Or the, not the compensation add, issue, workforce issue, Megan. I just want to add that um, I hope that compensation transitions into being one of the primary conversations as we move forward. I do think, I think you're right, Seal. I think it's the elephant in the room that doesn't get addressed. Um, and it, but we all know that's there and we've been talking about it for so long. So I hope that that happens. But the other thing that I think, and, and Cindy touched on this, that's so important is to pay attention to how funds funnel through that we're hoping land in teachers' pockets and make sure that there are not um, pathways for it to go into other areas. The childcare industry is so um, is so financially unstable right now, and many centers are coming back with, with repairs and staffing needs and so many other things that this money can get allocated to. We have to make sure that there is a system that the money lands in the pockets of teachers and that it lands in the pockets of all teachers so that it captures the entire state workforce, not just the workforce that work in certain sectors of, of the industry. Great. Thank you, Megan. Um, I know there are many more questions and many of them are very specific. Um, and I think it'd be difficult to answer them today again without the guidance um, that the state has not yet received. I just want to, before I close, I, I want to mention something that came up at the very beginning and also to acknowledge the work that Cindy and Megan are trying to do uh, to highlight access to the vaccine for childcare workers. You know, a couple of weeks ago, the governor announced that teachers and childcare staff were in the were eligible for the vaccine. That was great news, but we're very worried about how that's going to actually happen. And we've seen some efforts by districts, by communities, to ensure that teachers get vaccinated, the vaccine get vaccinated, yes, vaccinated. Um, but the it's much more challenging for childcare staff. And we've been exploring. We've been talking about: Are there any creative ways to ensure that? childcare staff uh, actually do get vaccinated. Many of them have been on the front lines during the pandemic and have put their lives at risk. I want to mention that because both Megan and Cindy have been strong advocates for this. And I don't want to go over time, but is there any, are there any ideas in terms of what we can do as a community, as a state, to make sure we make this a reality for childcare staff? I'm going to put you on the spot, Danielle. Are other states doing anything that we can learn from? Yeah. So, um, as I said, like Delaware had their very specific vac childcare vaccine si uh, day where they had everybody come to one space. I think that was a really brilliant way to do it, right? They had enough supply. They did a ton of public service announcements about it. They were there all day, long weekend days, but they got Thousands, literally thousands of providers vaccinated in a really short period of time. So I think, you know, if you can do that, if you can coordinate with um, the folks that have vaccine to do that and to target it, that's one thing to do. I will say that um, the other piece of it is information that we continue to see some reluctance on the part of, of folks to get the vaccine for lots of really, really understandable reasons. Um, the child care, the national child care community is, has put together a vaccine webinar specifically for child care providers to help explain what the vaccines are, what they do, what their impact is. Um, so, and I'll, I'll find that information to make sure you all have it. The third thing I would say, and this has been a real, um, a real stumbling block is make sure, making sure that folks who need to get the vaccine have paid time off both to get it and to recover from the effects. We're hearing it is fairly common that folks need 24 to 48 hours after sometimes the first, but almost always the second shot to recover from the effects. And that's perfectly normal, right? Many of us have those effects when we get the flu shot, like there's nothing wrong with those effects, but making sure that, that folks get paid time off to deal with that, that there are substitutes available, that's been a stumbling block for a lot of childcare providers as well. So those three things, information, 
um, access and leave time are really important to making sure our folks have access to the vaccine process. Thank you, Danielle. That is very helpful. This is a, a conversation we are going to continue. Well, we're at time. <clears throat> if we were meeting in person, this is the moment where I ask you all to join me in thanking this extraordinary panel. I think this has been a very rich and informative discussion uh, from the questions both in the chat and in the Q&A. I know that we've left a lot of specifics unanswered, but as I said, we are committed to getting the information out to you, um, both in terms of how the funding can be used, how those plans are made, as well as the state budget process and the CCDF plan. And um, Natasha, we put in the uh, chat links to where you can get information on the state level. I would encourage you to continue to check those out um, so that you remain informed. There's a lot, things change every day. There's a lot going on. You need to keep on top of that as well. Anything we can do to help, we will. You can email us about that. And I'm just going to, on all our behalf, thank this extraordinary panel. Um, first to Megan, who has been an amazing partner this year in advocacy, um, participating in everything from our virtual congressional visits, but most of all, from keeping us focused on the reality of what it means to provide childcare at this time, but as you point out often, even before the pandemic. So thank you for your advocacy. And Danielle, who's an incredible friend to New Jersey, who is our go-to resource on anything federal, um, who, can, who not only has it at your fingertips, but can talk about it in a way that we all understand. Uh, thank you, Danielle, we appreciate you. And to Natasha, um, I think the leadership that the state has under your leadership done over the last year to use the CARES Act funding to support child care, to ensure that families have access, I think is extraordinary. I don't. I know that many states have done similar activities, but it, it has been, I think, very meaningful in New Jersey. So thank you for your leadership. And Cindy, the voice for advocacy, all things budget, state policy around child care. Um, I think that certainly your actions this year have been so important. Um, and it's it has enabled ACNJ to be the resource we want to be for all of you. So thank you for joining us this morning. We will get back to you. We'll send out a recording of this webinar. We'll send out Danielle's slides and we'll repeat the access where you can get information from the state website and other sources. Um, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>